Hey, how are you guys doing? This is Keith Andavani, host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show and the Total Connector Show. I'm really super excited for this special episode with Marty Band and Zia Saad. Marty Band and Zia Saad, both of them actually don't need any introduction. Marty Band uh, is, you know, the um, author and um, the brain behind Tales of the Crypt together with Matt O'Dell and with his awesome newsletter which comes drops in every day and you know giving people the bigger picture so so the whole topic uh, what we're going to talk about circles around this recent uh, news about Iran's central bank uh, buying directly or there, there is an edict or some kind of law that, or proposal uh, but it's definite it's just the details not disclosed uh, and, and confidential so the central bank of Iran essentially going to buy directly from the Bitcoin miners in Iran and just a handful, maybe, I don't know, 14, 15 miners in Iran who have sort of the license, the permits to mine being subsidized. So the details, you know, are really not not disclosed yet at what rate and how they're going to purchase it. So my there are a bunch of questions surrounding, you know, this um, this recent update, this news and this is what we're going to talk about, like what kind of second, third order effects going to that have on other countries, central banks, Bitcoin mining globally. Would that lead, you know, also is that like interlinked, inter interconnected with the uh, critical adoption rate, with the mass adoption? And, you know, what's what's the situation in Iran? Like, you know, how do Iranians, uh, um, uh, you know, see uh, Bitcoin? How do they how do they interact with Bitcoin? Um, uh, and, you know, what are the authorities going to do, the Financial as uh, Action Task Force, this unappointed, uh, you know, organization, are they going to put like uh, Bitcoin addresses on the blacklist? So a bunch of uh, questions and I really appreciate, you know, all the work that Zia and uh, Zia Sadra and Marty Bent have been doing um, with their podcast, Tales of the Crypt and uh, Marty's Tales of the Crypt and his newsletter. And also his, his his company, which is also a co-founder of Great American Mining. So that's what we're going to also talk about. And Zia Trout, you know, has Zia has started his educational uh, YouTube channel, which I think is great. Just you know, for a lot of Iranians are in an urgent need to you know to gather knowledge, to acquire knowledge about you know to use the tools, wallets, samurai wallets, whatever that is, privacy, security and everything that surrounds that. So um, yeah, without further ado, this is my talk with Marty Ben and Zia Sadr. Hope you're gonna enjoy this and please like it, subscribe and share it. Thanks so much. All right, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. I'm really happy and pleased to have Zia Sadr and Uncle Marty Bent from Tales of the Crypt on my show. I've been, you know, wanting to do this show like uh, for a long time, uh, either one on one with you, Marty, or, or with both of you. And now we have a really good reason. So thanks again uh, for your time and coming to my show. How are you guys doing, Zia, Marty? Thank you, Kevin. So I'm I'm doing pretty well. Yeah. The weather is really good here in Tehran nowadays. So we're expecting a cold weather in the next few days, maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm doing well as well. Thank you for having me. Uh, Thanks, I'm very Mark. excited for the conversation. Yeah, I just actually received your newsletter. Uh, it's it's like a micro dosage of you know comprehension, expanding knowledge that you spread. And I think really, I really want to thank you, you know, for for all your work you do because it's I think it's indispensable all the work you're doing uh, and. Um, you know, I love your show. I loved, you know, those shows, you, especially you do one-on-one -on -one with Marty, uh, with uh, uh, Matt O'Dell, where, you know, there's those enlightening moments where Marty goes like, what the fuck is wrong with these people? Wake up, you know? And I'm like, he speaks exactly my language. You know, he knows exactly what's going on. But, you know, nevertheless, it's like on so many levels, you bring so much comprehension into this space with this on a, you know, geopolitical, macroeconomical, the essence of Bitcoin or technical level. So again, Thanks so much. Uh, so let me let me give a little bit of background info because I think most of my listeners uh, don't need an introduction to you guys. Uh, I'm just going to go right into the you know media's race. Um, um, what I want to talk about with you guys is, of course, you know the Iran situation. And uh, let me just summarize for for our listeners just uh, a couple of key points. So 
last as of last year, 2019, uh, Iran legalized the so-called cryptocurrency mining uh, and instituted heavy-handed regulations to control the practice. And then with access to oil reserves, of course, and relatively cheap electricity, Iran can now offer or could offer, you know, heavily subsidized power to miners and offset, you know, a bulk of the cost of mining cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, especially uh, for firms that play by the rules. I mean, every, anything else is shit coins, of, uh, but, you know, we, we don't need to go into that. Uh, alternatives to fiat currencies like the US dollar are attractive uh, to the powers in Iran as economic sanctions from the United States and other countries largely prevented from transacting with the world's reserve fiat currencies currency. And as Iran, uh, you know, the Iran uh, currency rial uh, suffers from hyperinflation, its people are seeking an alternative store value. So, you know, at the end of the day, because of these sanctions, it's, uh, you know, I don't care, uh, you know, I think we've got to get rid of every nation state. I mean, that's my position uh, with its, uh, you know, nation state government with its uh, whatever form it takes. But I do care, you know, about the people, whether they're in Iran, in the United States, or in Austria, where I live. So this is, you know, I guess the, uh, to sum it up, it's, um, it's what are we trying to achieve with Bitcoin, right? And so what I want to maybe start off with Zia, what is, uh, maybe can you give us, a, because there's a, some details that are, um, um, that are still somehow uh, not disclosed or confidential. So the Central Bank of Iran has, has decided to, buy off the, the directly from the Bitcoin miners in Iran, uh, Bitcoin, uh, or they call it whatever in general cryptocurrencies, in order to circumvent the sanctions and buy imports. Now, can you maybe give our listeners, can you give us like a little bit more details or insights, what's really going on and, um, and, and especially the re situation with the Bitcoin mining in Iran? Yeah, so this thing started uh, uh, like the regulation sides of Bitcoin here about mining in Iran started like two years ago. So they first started cracking down on miners. And then after a while, uh, then uh, a lot of miners tried to uh, somehow get close to the government and maybe help the government to regulate the space so that they could do their mining operations. So uh, this thing, this recent uh, news about the uh, about the central bank uh, like uh, using Bitcoin for imports and buying them like or maybe transferring them from miners to like uh, to to trades to to do trades with the world. Uh, this thing uh, is some is maybe somehow a result of those miners trying to lobby and like somehow help the government to <laughs> regulate themselves. So, uh, and uh, the situation with the mining here in Iran is not good. We have a lot of cheap electricity actually, and uh, uh, a, an abundance of energy like CHP, uh, what do you call them? CHP power plants and a lot of gas, uh, natural gas to be used as, as a source of electricity and it could all be used for mining because it's uh, it's really difficult to actually uh, export uh, gas and uh, so they could just uh, somehow uh, turn it into Bitcoin, just tra uh, transform it into Bitcoin this way and Bitcoin is, uh, it could, could really facilitate uh, this, this somehow export of gas for them. Uh, and they could just open up for like investors to come in, inside inside Iran and uh, do their investment and uh, like make big mining operations here in Iran. But unfortunately, the government doesn't do this, and uh, we don't actually know why. It's mostly because it's maybe mostly because that the government is not a unified body here in Iran. So some. Uh, some sections of the government may have their interest in not letting mining operations carry on. Some may have other uh, reasons to support mining in Iran. But overall, the thing is that the mining situation right now here in Iran is not uh, a healthy situation because most miners are trying to hide themselves, are doing their operations uh, uh, Secretly, that's generally a good practice, actually. But 
the thing is he, here they need to do it because the government will crack down on them because they call mining operations illegal unless they obtain some permits and stuff like that and uh, the permits uh, are not uh, are somehow ridiculous because the permits are only obtained by very few people and uh, uh, these permits uh, make the price of uh, energy for them price of electricity uh, much much higher than what it should be because uh, Iran has like maybe one or two uh, electricity rates for everyone anyone in the industries and households and all of that but the thing is for miners they have made this official electricity rate only for miners and it is maybe nine times the usual price so it may it may not be that profitable for miners to do their mining business uh, officially and uh, in a regulated way so this is generally not a good <laughs> situation here it's not uh, it's not the best for mining, but still, you see that miners are doing their thing in Iran and they are uh, actually doing their mining operations. So uh, actually, I don't think that what the government is trying to do will stop miners because, uh, well, it's much more profitable for people to do mining right now rather than that. It, or, or otherwise, they need like to do like the usual industries and uh, the usual industries and the economy, situa economy situation here in Iran is a, in a very bad situation too. So most uh, most businesses, most like factories and stuff like that go bankrupt. And uh, well, Bitcoin is not like that and Bitcoin offers them in, in another way uh, and it's much more profitable. So they're going to do it even if the government uh, cracks down on them. I know a lot of people who or even jailed because of mining here in Iran. But that didn't stop people from mining. It may have impacted the numbers, but uh, it's, it's slowly and gradually it's increasing. Mm -hmm. um, Marty, I mean, I'm, I'm real curious your take, um, uh, you know, what what would be from your perspective, because, you know, you are the co-founder or founder of Gold, uh, uh, Great American Mining, would it have um, with this pr process? I mean, if they really, if they, if they have like cheap electricity, cheap energy in Iran, and they, and and as I've heard, you know, also from you, they're just a very small number of of people who have, uh, you know, official sort of license or permit to do mining. But I mean, it would be so logical. It would be like the next rational step to go fully into Bitcoin mining. Would that have what kind of cascading effect or triggering effect would that have on other miners? Like you know, for your company or or for you know upstream data, for example, with Street Barber or other miners. What would be the implication? Where, where do you see this going? I think uh, Zaya touched on it a bit. The inability for Iranian gas producers to build pipelines to, to send their gas to other markets to profit that way really forces uh, those producers in Iran to get, um, to get creative. And that's actually one of our taglines and something we, we say when we're, when we're pitching great American mining to oil and gas producers is that Bitcoin mining is, is a digital pipeline. So instead of building a pipeline in, in uh, trying to build it across borders and then send that gas across borders if it's being hindered by sanctions or just the inability of uh, a government to, to allow a free market to develop so that producers can um, uh, send that gas to market. And Bitcoin mining is the perfect solution because you actually don't have to build that pipeline. You can just send that gas a few dozen feet to your generators and turn it into Bitcoins. Um, but it seems like the government's doing something similar to what uh, the government in Quebec did to the miners that were using their uh, hydroelectric dam, where they sort of, uh, they, um, they set different uh, prices for, for people who were mining specifically off the hydroelectric um, get, uh, energy. So that it is annoying that the state steps in and sort of perturbs entrepreneurs in the free market from actually just taking advantage of, of low energy costs and would actually make sense for everybody to allow that market to develop freely um, in terms of how would an, a budding uh, Iranian 
mining industry affect what we do at Great American Mining or somebody like an upstream data that Steve Barber is building, it would just add hash rate to the network. Uh, and uh, depending on how many miners we're plugging in at any given point in time, it would just it would have just affect our total overall uh, hash rate percentage that we have. Um, the the opportunity that cheap natural gas provides the world uh, of miners, particularly, we think we can mine profitably, uh, even if the Bitcoin price crashes pretty significantly due to how cheap the gas is, especially where we're consuming it. Um, so from a like direct network competition standpoint, it would just affect hash rate a bit, um, which would affect our overall percentage of hash rate. And then what I'm more interested to see is if um, the US, the G10 countries, people are in UN and NATO, how they react. Um, like, will there be a strong uh, reaction to an Iranian central bank using Bitcoin to purchase imports just from a regulatory perspective? So maybe uh, the effect from a network competition standpoint isn't as great as the potential regulatory crackdown that the West could potentially um, pursue. Uh, and they use all these boogeymen like, oh, Iran is mining Bitcoin. Like, so you guys can't use Bitcoin. That's one thing I'm worried about, um, but not too worried about it. I think Bitcoin's come too far. Um, it's been around for too long and there's a lot of entrenched industries and individuals in the U.S. that um, it'd be really hard to to sort of stop Bitcoin at this point here. Do you see any other like second, third order effects? Like if, you know, on a, let's say we're really optimistic, it would, I mean, the, the unfortunate thing is, is really that Iranian government or, you know, this, this theocratic regime is, is actually intervening into the free market. I mean, there is no free market. We, we don't have in general, no free market. There's no free market. There's no real capitalism actually, but, you know, it's really severe in Iran. So if they are like, uh, you know, to, at least uh, in, in, in negotiation with the official uh, permitted licensed uh, Bitcoin miners are saying, and they don't, we don't even know yet, you know, at what price they're going to set, you know, the, the uh, you know, the Bitcoin and, and, and how they're going to buy it. I mean, are there any details like this close, Zia? Because I find it unfortunate that, you know, it's a total uh, governmental intervention into the, you know, into huge potential. Well, the thing with the government here is that, uh, well, the government is actually uh, what they disclosed was that the first enactment of the cabinet, uh, uh, the first uh, article of the enactment that the cabinet office issued uh, last year, I guess, uh, I think, uh, the, the first article was changed. It was uh, what it was before. It was... Uh, Bitcoin transfers or transactions are not permitted inside of Iran for like institutions and uh, other uh, organizations or something like that. Uh, then they changed it now to uh, they could be used, uh, these transfers, they, this could be used to for imports because like we may have like difficulties in imports uh, for uh, actually sending money for imports. Now it could be used for that. So the thing with the Central Bank of Iran getting in this uh, equation is that the Central Bank is uh, is really manipulative and they try to plan and actually mostly interfere with uh, procedures here in Iran. Uh, they do this with the USD. So we have uh, like we had uh, increase of you like the, the price surge of USD like a t tens of times in the last few years, and it's mostly due to what like central banks and also like political stuff with the uh, foreign policies and all that. Uh, and uh, the central bank is always even as sometimes they even issue uh, I don't know. Like announcements every week about uh, the USD price 
and uh, they they are always trying to somehow uh, control the market and control the prices. So when it comes down to Bitcoin, they're gonna, I guess it's it's going to be the same way. They're going to handle this thing uh, similar to what they do to the to the USD market here in Europe, and uh, they may have this. Uh, what do you call it? There's a system. It's called NEMA exchange system or something. It's uh, for people who want to like use USD for imports or exports or something like that. And uh, the central bank like decides the price and they decide even how much you can use. Actually, uh, like they may tell you that you can only use one or two thousand dollars a day or I don't know one hundred thousand dollars a month or something like that. Uh, so they, they, they may design a system like that for Bitcoin. So, uh, in a way that they may, uh, like, uh, receive the Bitcoin from miners or, uh, somehow manage or control that the miners sends the Bitcoin to the one who needs Bitcoin for, um, for, to be used for imports. And, uh, currently there are no details about what they are going to do. But uh, this is the idea that they, uh, it's the same idea that they do with USD. And I guess it would be the same for Bitcoin too. Because if it's, if it, so let's imagine another way. Any other way would, with the central bank in the middle would be that the central bank should hold Bitcoin. And that's, I guess, something that the central bank doesn't want people to uh, think about, like, uh, so I'm the central bank of Iran and I'm holding Bitcoin. So that's that's uh, something that uh, if, if they want to interfere, that's going to be the way. They're not going to be the holder of Bitcoins and they don't want to announce such a thing, even if they do it somehow. Yeah. So I guess it's, uh, we should wait and see what, what they're going to do. You know, I always say, and I think a lot of other Bitcoiners say that too, like Giacomo Zucco, or I don't know, what's your position, <laughs> uh, Marty, on that is, I always say, you know, Bitcoin is the black market money for total humanity. So it's not going to prevent people from, you know, eventually, because uh, Zia, you know, is, is, is just started his educational channel on YouTube, you know, uh, on whatever, whatever uh, Samurai wallet, wallets, privacy, security. I mean, really also basic stuff that people really, a lot of people don't even have a clue about what kind of risks they're taking or uh, especially when it comes to security and privacy so um do you think it's lex this is an inevitable process like you know this this to to reach this intransigent minority or critical mass adoption uh, whether it's in iran or elsewhere what is what is your your position on that mark where do you see this going yeah i mean i think these type of actions from central banks and governors Government should be expected. They're not going to just let Bitcoin happen without a fight or without trying to slow it down, at least. And they'll try to annoy Bitcoin users as much as possible. Uh, but I do think Bitcoin's permissionless and distributed nature makes it inevitable uh, to succeed for the individual. Like, for example, if there are natural gas producers in Iran that aren't sending that gas to the grid and they're able to somehow mine off grid um, out of the uh, site of the government. Like they can mine Bitcoin for themselves and not have to deal with the government. But obviously there's risk involved. If you don't get the permit, they find out that you're mining, you can potentially get in some trouble. So it's just the individuals within Iran weighing, weighing the risk of, of mining, quote unquote, illegally off grid, which is harder to um, sort of locate and and uh, stop uh, if you can do it in like small small little chunks like we, we do our mining in shipping containers and it just looks like there's a shipping container sitting on a, a well pad or natural gas uh, around a natural gas pipeline and it's sort of hard to know exactly what's going on in that box unless you step in it so from a logistics standpoint if enough producers are mining Bitcoin on the down low off grid it could be hard to catch. Um, and then they could mine Bitcoin and, and use it the way they see fit without having to go through the, the government. But um, yeah, it, it, it gets too hard to, um, to stop from a logistics standpoint at a certain 
at a certain point because there's just too many people doing it um, on, a, on a smaller level that it's like, like whack-a-mole, but I'm not sure. I, I, uh, I'm not an expert on what's going on in Iran and that's just a possibility if, if people are willing to risk that because you also have to get the miners into the country, which is uh, a potential attack vector, border agents seeing that you're getting miners delivered can rat you out and stuff like that. So um, there's a lot of things to take into consideration, but yeah, I think this is just a temporary roadblock um, that we have to deal with our generation. Um, I think in a couple generations from now, uh, we'll look back and laugh at, at the attempts to stop this thing. How many illegal miners are, do you think are there in Iran, Zia? I mean, you said, you know, there's the, most of them, the majority is like doing it illegal, right? When they just... Yeah, I, actually, it's, it's really funny. The, the word illegal should be used for something which is not legal. But the thing is that the miners are like, uh, like when they started, they, they, were, they were not thinking that they're doing an illegal thing because it, it was electricity provided with the industrial electricity rates, which is a standard. So you could use that electricity and pay the price. And you are paying the price of electricity to the government. So what's wrong? Why do you criminalize the action, this act? Because you see miners profiting a lot and you have a very bad electricity grid uh, in a very bad situation. It's, it's, it's very inefficient. And you are afraid that the, like the government is afraid that the, the rise of miners and uh, this profitability from Bitcoin may uh, affect the government in, in some aspects like from a monetary standpoint and from uh, like people may start using Bitcoin in the country. And that's something which is not, uh, <clears throat> and it, will, it, it may not be approved by the government. They, they will not approve of that because they won't have any control on, on people this way. And the other thing would be that they, they, the miners may take down the grid because it's a very inefficient grid. And that's actually a very serious and very, uh, it, it, it makes sense. It, it may, this may happen, actually, if uh, miners use the grid. <clears throat> so miners started using... Uh, uh, power plants. So we have a lot of private power plants all over Iran, and uh, they started using power plants. The power, uh, the CHP uh, with CHP gas generators from uh, like gas uh, source, and uh, the gas source is also provided by the government. Uh, and uh, they started doing this, and they started uh, generating their own electricity, and uh, the government started. To crack down on power plants too. So now what? What's what's wrong? What's what we are doing wrong? So they said that we have a subsidy on the gas price, and now we should take this subsidy, and you should uh, the miners should pay uh, the actually the price of gas without a subsidy, and then they like. Uh, made this tariffs or electricity rates for miners. Uh, so actually, I, what I wanted to say is that mining was not <laughs> illegal and it was not a criminal activity or something. The government is always seeking ways to criminalize, criminalize this act. Even if you find a way which is not, which is completely legal, completely regulated, they, they, they are trying to find it. <laughs> Uh, the, the government trying to find new ways to criminalize this. So how many miners are do, doing mining operations in Iran? Um, not on the government's uh, like standards, not using the government standards? Well, we simply don't know. There's, uh, there's this, uh, there's, there are some analysis about like the amount of hash rate in Iran. And we may somehow calculate something we could just say like there's like, i don't know 50 100 megawatts i don't i, I don't remember the, the 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 percent of my hash rate uh, for miners in iran but uh i guess it was like three percent or four percent of the 
people call Bitcoin network or something like that. So we could just have a picture of what uh, what is the mining current situation of mining operations in Iran. And uh, we could say that actually none of that hash rate is uh, regulated or being done legally from the government standpoint. Uh, so, uh, and most, as Marty said, most people are uh, trying to somehow hide their their operations, and they are carrying on with their <coughs> with their operations. Um, uh, I heard that now. Is that official that Iran or the Central Bank of Iran has uh, changed its uh, its uh, uh, reserve uh, currency mm -hmm. uh, uh, or the tr you know the, the trading currency t uh, from from US dollar to Chinese uh, yuan is that is that official or, or? Uh, I don't think so I'm not sure okay because of the sanctions yeah <clears throat> mm -hmm. well they may try different things they talked about euros back in, in before in the past they were changing it to euro because they always want to keep this uh, this uh, position that they have that they are opposing the United States so they may do it like that but uh, most people use like USD most trades are being conducted with USD the black market for USD and I guess Durham also uh, Emirates Durham is uh, are the main things that are used in Iran because of imports which are uh, actually conducted mostly from Dubai, from, uh, from United Emir Emirates. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, the main thing is USD and uh, there's a little portion which is uh, dedicated to their hunt. Mm -hmm. uh, Marty, I mean, if, uh, I mean, I understand, you know, that uh, the central bank of Iran, Iranian government may be trying to keep a low profile and they wouldn't even probably admit it if it were, tr even if it were true that, they're you know stacking up sats or, or bitcoin as a reserve asset um but what if they did i mean that this is my question like what are what would be the long-term effects or implication consequences would that like trigger something like a process of so-called hyper bitcoinization eventually or how would you interpret that? i don't know if it would incite hyper bitcoinization uh immediately or anything like that but no i just think it, it sort of validates Bitcoin's uh, incentive system, right? Like when you're pushed to the, into a corner and you're, you're forced to uh, get creative, particularly from a monetary perspective, from accessing a, a global economy, like Bitcoin is there for you. Like, and it's pretty messed up that um, Iran has been sanctioned to a point where they have to turn to Bitcoin to actually import goods into their country. But luckily, Bitcoin is there for them. It's an apolitical distributed cash system that anybody can access no matter if you're sanctioned or not. So uh, I think it, if it were ever to be the case where the Iranian uh, central bank announced that it was stacking sats and holding Bitcoin on its balance sheet, it would just be a data point that highlights uh the Bitcoin works and then maybe uh, it incites other countries in particular situations similar to Iran. I mean, Venezuela is already doing it. We know that, but uh, maybe, maybe someone like Brazil or countries in Africa start adding, adding Bitcoin to their balance sheets because uh, other countries start doing it. And so, uh, yeah, I think Bitcoin adoption in terms of, it being adopted by like central banks around the world, it's going to start the Iran's and Venezuela's and African nations um, being first movers, and it will work its way up towards uh, the um, the bigger central banks, whether it be Bank of Japan, uh, Federal Reserve, ECB, stuff like that. And I think it happens um, in countries that need it most first. Do you see that like a sort of a dynamic interplay, um, you know, with companies like MicroStrategy, MicroSale, all these companies, and now maybe even, you know, uh, mutual funds and eventually pension funds and 
and now governments, central banks, is there a dynamic interplay? Is, uh, or, uh, like, what would be the effect? Like, if, if it starts, like, this is what they call, like, hyperbrit is like, you know, pe um, different, on different levels, individuals, companies, funds, pension funds, eventually, you know, central banks, uh, uh, putting it on balance sheets, putting it in their reserve assets sheets. Yeah, I don't think there's like a direct interplay of one a, one decision affecting or one event affecting the next, but I think they're separate and disparate events where you have uh, a micro strategy accumulating Bitcoin on their balance sheet. You have a company like Square putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet, and at the same time, uh, you have the Iranian central bank putting it on their central on their balance sheet, or if they're not putting it on their balance sheet, they're using it for imports and each individual actor in the scenarios I just laid out, just helps solidify and validate Bitcoin's use case and value proposition to the world. And uh, if you have the Michael Saylors and the Jack Dorsey's of the world over here in the U S adding Bitcoin to their balance sheets as publicly traded American companies and, putting their trust uh, in the network and being very vocal and public about that. Uh, and at the same time, you have uh, central banks of countries that are sanctioned by the U.S. doing the same thing. I think it actually makes it harder <laughs> for the U.S. government to uh, stop Bitcoin, even though someone they perceive as an enemy um, is, is using it to their benefit. You, know, you have that happening, but as well as some of your most innovative entrepreneurs uh, within U.S. borders believing in it as well. So you have to explain to them why they're not able to to leverage something they believe in so ardently, um, which if America is truly the land of the free, uh, it, it'd be hard to, to ban it here. Again, at this point, especially if Bitcoin price does what it does, uh, or it has done in the past over the next 12 to 18 months. And you sort of repeat another bull cycle and you, you induce the FOMO of, of individuals and companies here in the United States adding Bitcoin to their personal or company balance sheets. It's just going to be very hard. I think the cat's out of the bag. And so I don't think uh, like the Iranian central bank using Bitcoin to purchase imports affects uh, Michael Saylor's decision to add to his Bitcoin. I just think they're uh, separate events happening at different parts of the world at the same time uh, that benefit Bitcoin uh, when when combined. Sia, so, you wanted to add something, sir? No. Okay. Sorry. So um, you know the, the the mother of all inventions or creativity or action, human action is is you know out of necessity. It's, it's pain, suffering, pain points. So maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I see sort of a exponential adoption rate uh, wherever, you know, uh, globally, but especially now we're, we're talking Iran. Now let's go to, to some of these questions that, um, uh, you know, one of our followers uh, asked is like, I mean, you partially answered that, I think, uh, Marty, at the beginning. What is the FATF, the Financial Action Task Force, going to do? Can we see more Bitcoin addresses on the blacklist for the huh. first question? Um, so what is the financial action task force going to do? Yeah. I mean, they're already, they've already released guidelines, uh, sort of highlighting different aspects of the Bitcoin network, how it's used, uh, how people use it privately and created a list of red flags to look out for. Yeah. I think they'll have a blacklist of addresses. I mean, one already exists. The OFAC has a blacklist. Of yeah. Bitcoin address, um, particularly from funds that have been stolen from exchanges in the past, and I believe some that were associated with ISIS as well. Um, but yeah, so the Financial Action Task Force, they, it's funny because they essentially, they don't actually pass laws. They, they create guidelines that then get passed on to the governments that are partnered in the Financial Action Task Force, which is basically all your Western governments and um, a few others. And so the FATF will write guidelines that will then be adopted by the regulators in any given country. 
Um, so yeah, I think they'll they'll be alarmist about it and try to create blacklist. But again, I think it'll be uh, a losing battle at the end of the day. Yeah. I think. I mean, I guess the purpose I mean, is like to taint those pain Bitcoin, right? It means to taint. I mean, what it, I mean, you can deal. Could you, you know, like technically speak, like delink them, like coin mix them? So you know, so many times. I mean, I'm not a techie, but uh, would that be a viable op, you know strategy to to uh, untaint yeah, them? Can. Yeah, you could coin join them. Um, many things you can do. Uh, the number of things that you can do too will be increased if we ever get Schnorr and Taproot uh, activated uh, in the protocol as well. Um, but yeah, you could coin join uh, using an implementation like Samurai Wasabi Join Market. Uh, you, can, you can use Lightning to attempt to create privacy, like the the amount of developments happening on the lightning network right now that will enable you to essentially do um, find privacy via the second layer or expanding on top of that liquid. Yeah, that was, a, uh, by the way, a very beautiful episode you did just recently. I listened to it yesterday, this three hour long episode with, what's his name? Gentry or? G Ryan Gentry, yes. Ryan Gentry, yeah. From lightning yeah. Labs. Really yeah, mind blowing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's, so I think those blacklists, um, again, I think they'll be made, but I don't think they'll be as effective in the long run because I think Bitcoin's privacy tech, whether it be uh, at the protocol level, be a Schnorr and Taproot, which aren't perfect for privacy, but they certainly help uh, in combination with second layer solutions like Lightning, Liquid, uh, a state chain implementation just got launched on Bitcoin's testnet and Mercury wallet. Um, so if you get state chains and you combine them with something like coin swaps or pay join uh, and um, do submarine swaps with liquid and stuff like that, like it's, it's going to be easier to attain privacy and therefore harder to enforce the blacklist that will come out. But yeah, I think they'll come out with blacklist it will be a temporary nuisance, but nothing more than that. Awesome. <laughs> Very, very, so, very exciting. Actually, I wanted to add on what Martin said. That, uh, uh, one thing that, uh, like, I had this idea. I, I saw some of uh, some people, like, you know, we live in Iran and we have been always uh, targeted to, uh, like, we we had a lot of like exchanges banned people from uh, their platforms. Like, Bitrix did that, Poloniex did that, Bitfinex did that. It makes it, all of the exchanges actually. Most exchanges have banned users from Iran, so we have been always targeted, like for foreign bank accounts. Like in any country, they are gonna sh shut down your account because you're an Iranian. So the thing with Bitcoin exchanges here in Iran, uh, there were a lot of. So when I talk about coin join and mixing to uh, people uh, to, in my Twitter and in Telegram groups and all that. So uh, I had people uh, come to me and tell me that, uh, can we expect or imagine uh, Iranian exchanges, Bitcoin exchanges, to offer uh, mixing or coin join as uh, some of their key features in the future? So like uh, this exchange had like has already coin join built in and they always coin join their coins before they give it to you. So uh, they could somehow hide the trace of ownership to like be earning an exchange or something. Can we see this in the future? So I, it was like an interesting idea to maybe that uh, Bitcoin exchanges in Iran, maybe in the future they need to do such a thing. Because I remember that when the first Iranians, Bitcoin, first Bitcoin addresses got on the SDM list from the OFAC, uh, it was two exchangers from Iran. Uh, and these guys uh, like built with uh, bitcoins from ransomwares, and uh, they obviously we didn't know that this is, this bitcoin comes from ransomwares, and they got on the SDN list. Uh, that's a very stupid list. There's two addresses which got <laughs> who got on the SDN list, and two people, two names. So we had the first blacklist actually had for, uh, bitcoin exchangers in Iran. So it's uh, it's not a very far-fetched idea to see Bitcoin exchanges in Iran to offer mixing as a feature 
uh, not mixing for the user, mixing as to hide the trace that it comes from the Bitcoin exchange in Iran. Yeah, and you're, you actually already see this in Canada with Bull Bitcoin. They they uh, coin join their deposits. I'm pretty sure already using Wasabi. So there is a precedent for an exchange doing that here in North America. I wouldn't be surprised. It just comes down to a matter of of price, like where the fee market is too. Like is the is it profitable to to actually coin join uh, and provide a good service that's cheap enough for your customers? But yeah, no, I think there's plenty of people doing it and I think there will be even more um, unique second layer privacy solutions that are cheaper that'll make more sense too so yeah I think that'll definitely be a thing should be demanded too uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna tie in a little bit uh, my question or my desire my wish because it's always you know I, I mean I, I really want to see mass adoption I always said that it's gonna be you know most probably one of these countries, you know, that are sanctioned, hyperinflationary countries like Venezuela, Iran, that's going really to trigger this, this, uh, I call it a, a adoption rate, you know, a critical adoption rate. Because uh, there's some questions from uh, from Bitcoin Max Radio. Is like, how do normal Iranians look at Bitcoin? And I see, you know, urgent need. There is a lack of knowledge. And I see, you know, how people are, you know, getting to use uh, and, and and starting, you know, asking your questions everywhere. Uh, you know, do they use it for transactions? How do normal Iranians buy Bitcoin and how do Iranian banks look at Bitcoin? Like, what's the atmosphere? I mean, maybe you want to give like a general overview. What's going on? So banks don't deal with Bitcoin in Iran. So they don't, don't like, you could use your bank account to buy Bitcoin. So that's the thing that I heard that uh, most foreign countries don't let people do. But you could use your bank account to buy Bitcoin. And you could buy maybe even large amounts of Bitcoin uh, using your bank account and bank transfers. But the banks themselves don't uh, transfer Bitcoin or they don't touch Bitcoin at all, which seems, <laughs> yeah, it's commonsensical. So, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry. And, uh, but the most, uh, mo the most uh, methods of, uh, like accessing Bitcoin here in Iran are like exchanges and OTCs. Some uh, Bitcoin somehow very very similar to Bitcoin vendors or something, where you could just um, uh, the, they some of them have the websites, some of uh, some use Telegram channels or Telegram accounts, and you just tell them that I want Bitcoin, and they tell you that uh, how much you give them the money, and they send you the Bitcoin. It is all mostly conducted by uh, bank transfers, although. And uh, uh, there are very few methods of uh, accessing Bitcoin uh, with no KYC. It's you should either know people or have friends who could like uh, provide you with Bitcoin because we have a very, very uh, failing payment system here in Iran, which is... Uh, which is crowded with fraud, money fraud, and bank banking fraud. And uh, actually, the exchanges don't KYC you, so they could use the information. If, if they have to, they will use the information. But the first reason for them is that the exchanges don't get in trouble because they just got some uh, fraud money, and uh, they should just pay the, pay back the money while they, while they uh, gave the Bitcoin. So the exchanges try to protect themselves. Uh, that's why they do KYC. But, well, we know that KYC is no good. So uh, I hope to see some more methods. So I know that HODL HODL supports like the Iranian market and they have a Telegram group for Farsi, for uh, Farsi users and they have like content in Farsi. And uh, I know that uh, people could use BISC too. But because of the situation with the uh, banking fraud and uh, with the situation inflation, you can't just like, let me do this is a piece of fiat money here. So if you want to use such a piece, you're going to need <clears throat> like two basket <laughs> cases, maybe of this just to buy like 0 0.1 Bitcoin. 
So what's the inflation just rate? Uh, so yeah, is it, is yeah. the inflation rate is around, is it around like thirty four percent? Is that is that in oh, I don't know. I can't I can't keep track of okay. that. And it's it's not it's not actually uh, official. It's like we don't have an official thing about inflation mm -hmm. rates here in Iran. They don't even we don't have, even have a USD uh, price uh, officially. It's all black market. So so I don't know if anyone could actually uh, calculate that. So uh, that's the, that's the thing with by accessing Bitcoin here in Iran, and uh, about using Bitcoin. So I'm, I'm this is the surprising part that like in 2017 and 2018, where the main thing was investing in Bitcoin. I was always thinking that when would it be possible to see people using Bitcoin mm -hmm. who have no clue about Bitcoin? When would it be possible to see people use Bitcoin and they don't know anything about Bitcoin? They uh, they uh, maybe and they they only see it a, me a method for to facilitate their transactions or something. They they may they it's not like that they are Bitcoin enthusiasts. And right now I'm seeing this and I'm really surprised actually, uh, like in the last few months, six months or so, I, I've seen people do remittance with Bitcoin, people who are like doctors, like people who are uh, students in foreign countries and send Bitcoin back to home mm -hmm. to their uh, parents. And, and I see a lot of people who are interested in using Bitcoin for the businesses uh, uh, like some artists, some who want to work with foreign uh, businesses or foreign people. Uh, some uh, like uh, there are a lot of people who are saving. Um, they, they are ch changing their savings from I don't know USD or gold or 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 even or mostly fiat to Bitcoin. And this is happening all the time with people who know who know who are not Bitcoin enthusiasts. Who don't who are not following Bitcoin actually? They see that the they, the only thing they may follow is the price. That they see that that okay, the Bitcoin price is rising. So what's Bitcoin? Is it peer to peer network? They don't know. They they see it just a better option, better alternative. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, th this is the situation with the adoption here. It's not like that. There are millions of people getting into this. But I'm seeing a lot of people, so I, I've never saw this in 2017 or 2018. So yeah, the, 2000, this is, yeah. yeah, this is what I'm talking that about. Time it was only traders. Yeah, it was only traders and investors and Bitcoin enthusiasts. Yeah. Now even the traders are less. Uh, I see less traders than before because it, Bitcoin is not very easy to trade, and uh, I see more people who want to use to invest store their value in Bitcoin, actually. Awesome. Uh, very interesting. You know, Marty, um, um, uh, if my demographics st stats are correct, I think 70 to 80 percent of Iran's population is, correct me if I'm wrong, is approximately between 30 and 35 years old. So a pretty, let's say, relatively young generation. I mean, what would be your message to these people? And I'm like, you know, this is this would be the hope, you know, to break free, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> break totally free. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm qualified to be sending uh, motivational speeches to the people in Iran, but no, I was. I mean, Bitcoin provides an alternative that allows you to do things that you can't do within your current system, and that you're not allowed to based on uh, countries outside of your your own dictating how you can use your money. And that's we're at a pivotal point in human history, whether you're an American or an Iranian, like. <laughs> The, the monetary system that we're all subjected to, uh, the global monetary system run by the U.S. dollar, does not care for the individual. And if we keep going down this path and stay on this course, you're, you're, we're all basically, no matter where we are in the world, going to be cattle herded into a digital panopticon in which the powers that be control your ability to move and earn money. Uh, and they're going to dictate where you can do it, how you can do it, who you can do it with. And that's not the way the world should work. I mean, I think any Iranians watching this right now probably understand this a lot better than, than people living in America, frankly. Uh, you've been subjected to it already. And I think that will continue to happen uh, across the rest of the world. And Bitcoin simply provides an alternative where that's not possible. If you want to 
have full control of your money and uh, use a monetary system that respects your purchasing power and your, your slice of the overall pie and Bitcoin is, is that monetary system for you as you're experiencing hyperinflation, having to go to the, to a broker with baskets of, of your currency to buy 0.01 Bitcoin. Uh, I think that, if anything, that should really highlight the need for Bitcoin as you can get away from that, that system that forces you to carry baskets of, of cash around just to buy simple goods. Um, that won't be necessary under a Bitcoin standard. And uh, more importantly, it's just it's a, a vehicle for liberty in the digital age. Uh, around the world, which is pretty exciting. And you can send that Bitcoin wherever, as, as I was uh, explaining. You can be a Iranian student here in America, and you can send money back to your parents with ease, and there's not going to be any questions asked. The Bitcoin network doesn't know to ask any questions. Even, and even if these blacklisted uh, blacklist uh, address uh, come out, like if you're using Bitcoin in a non-custodial fashion and you actually hold it, it doesn't matter. You can still get around that blacklist, um, sending it through the network. Um, yeah, no, I think the message is simple. Like, do you want to use a better money, one that respects you and your autonomy uh, fully or just subject yourself to uh, the Iranian monetary system and then the global monetary system run on the dollar, which is controlled by politicians and corrupt bureaucrats who, who really don't care about you at the end of the day. And entities that are above the law. I mean, I need to emphasize this every time the central banks above the law. This is why, you know, I love your newsletter, the, the podcast you do, Tales of the Crypt, because you give people, you know, the zoom out bigger picture of why are we doing this? You know, you just touch upon, you know, the panopticon surveillance. I mean, we're going into direction. We're going to extreme direction. It's either centralized or, or you know, enslavement, con total control and surveillance or total decentralization and freedom and prosperity and abundance. Uh, or I don't know, or do can we have a parallel society evolving out of this, whatever, with free private cities and all these, you know, not utopian visions. Um, so that's why, you know, again, I, I said in the beginning, I love your work because it gives people the bigger picture, the bigger comprehension of why are we doing this? Why Bitcoin? You know, and it's right there. It's the, you know, it's the elephant in the room. We, we just need to learn, educate ourselves and use it. That's all we need to do, right? Yeah. And <laughs> It's, it is here. Yeah. I think it's inevitable at this point. It's just whether how quickly it's adopted. And, and that's the whole, I think it'll be like more importantly, most importantly, probably is it'll lead to a peaceful world. <laughs> like you don't, yeah. or a much more peaceful world. Like if you have the world has a lot of conflict right now because of the, the monetary system that forces people to go through the U S dollar to buy commodities and to, transact across borders like why should the u.s government its regulators and the federal reserve have full control over the money that basically prices everything around the world it doesn't make a lot of sense it doesn't seem very fair and it leads to a lot of conflict particularly in the energy markets particularly there's a lot of proxy wars over being able to move um gas and oil across borders um and the U.S. tends to favor countries who um, who will protect its status as the, the, the arbiter of the petrodollar. And so Bitcoin, an apolitical currency that is not controlled by any one sovereign nation, just, just creates a condition where peaceful trade can happen. You don't have to worry about that friction of mm -hmm. uh, foreign exchange, which is just a, an added cost to, to buying stuff around the world. Like, um, I'm told... Here in America, that Iran's a pretty terrible country. I'm sitting here talking to an Ar Iranian citizen. He seems like a really cool dude, very similar to me. Like you can get away from these these politicians who, um, who really mess things up for for the common man. With people like uh, Zaya and myself who just want to <laughs> raise a family and eat well and be a good person. Like it's 99.9 percent .9 of people around the world. Yeah. 
And you know, you you you, talk, you you said peace. I mean, it's not some 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 kind of utopian kitsch thing. I mean, this is if people just understood. Sometimes I'm thinking after after talking to Jeff Booth, you know, you you, you talk about to him. To, it's like deflationary economies. What kind of prosperity and abundance and freedom people could have with, you know, not only the information technology or smartphones, but I'm like on every structural level you can think of, like on every economical level, on every scientific technological level that could literally like serve humanity like people would literally uh work less much much less maybe 15 20 hours voluntarily and the rest of the time they would really contribute back to society and we would have yeah you know i mean i, I don't need to go on a rant here but <laughs> it's the future is so bright if just people understood what is true the you know the effects or the the bigger picture behind capitalism free market principles uh you know, not not distorting price signals and the hardest and scarcest money, Bitcoin, right? <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's crazy. Learn about money; <laughs> it's important. It's uh, it's uh, we broke, we fucked up the money. We need to fix it. Bitcoin fixes it. Uh, yeah, most most people in the world don't realize it yet, but I, I truly believe that is the core of a lot of the, the strife that we see around the world today that we fucked up the money we need to fix it yeah beautiful said now that's a good way to wrap this up any final thoughts or anything we we maybe i left out questions or anything we should know or or, or where can people find you of course uh zia marty yeah well, you could just, just find me on twitter yeah but, so i want to just do actually i have friends uh here who are uh, actually a fan of uh, what Marty does in his uh, newsletter. And uh, they wanted to tell me, I, uh, they, they tell, told me that, uh, just to say this to Marty, that you do, they, they wanted to thank you and uh, they wanted to uh, say hi to Matt too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm flattered. It's crazy. Uh, that's another beautiful part of bitcoin too I just wrap up on this note like it just brings people from around the world together around this this one open source protocol that, that is giving liberty back to people in the digital age like it's beautiful just being a part of it as a content creator having people reach out from iran uh, which is crazy to me if you were to tell me five years ago that i would have <laughs> iranians reading a newspaper but right uh, a newsletter I'd write and they'd actually like it. It'd be, I'd be like, what? That's crazy. So um, it just highlights part of the beautiful nature of Bitcoin, the fact that the common man around the world, the common man, no matter where he is, if he's in the United States and Iran and Africa and China, wherever he may be, he's able to focus on this protocol and build it out together without any anybody stopping them um, or, or at least stopping most of them. Which is which is a pretty beautiful thing that we're able to do this on a global level and work together. This common man to common man uh, in different borders is is pretty pretty crazy that we're we're all building up a system that could potentially unshackle us from from uh, the enslavement of uh, a world that runs on a money that runs on debt. Um, it's like a, a global Manhattan project that we're doing under the scenes and it's, it feels pretty cool to be a part of. And I, yeah, again, I'm extremely flattered that your friends uh, read uh, the newsletter and listen to the podcast. I'll definitely be sure to pass along a message to Matt. Um, you guys keep fighting a good fight too. We're big fans of you guys. Cause it's, probably, it's arguably probably harder to use Bitcoin and more risky in Iran than it is in the U S today. So anybody that's putting their neck out there and, trying to educate others despite um despite what the government may or may not do to you it's uh it's laudable and something i respect the hell out of so thank you for doing what you do as well Zia. yeah thanks we have a lot of friends actually nowadays i have this friend who translated the bitcoin white paper to farsi and actually it's on bitcoin.org right now i have another friend who recently contributed to the bitcoin code actually and uh, these are all the oh, yeah. we have friends who are actually contributing to some rewards. They they are trying to build like better like a GUI for Windows actually. 
So we have it on Linux. Uh, we have it on Linux, but we don't have a GUI for Whirlpool on uh, Windows. So they're building that. They they are trans. Some of them are translating different books. Uh, like the last book that was translated. Uh, this is all doing. Uh, this is all being done actually uh, in a, in a non non profitable way. They they are just doing it for their passion. They want to just. Uh, increase the awareness raise the awareness here about bitcoin you know, the last book was, that was translated quote was this little bit coin book actually it was by alex and yeah jimmy song uh so we, we were seeing a lot of these contributions nowadays we have like open source stuff right now people are cont contributing or like translating stuff and uh, I, I recently started actually educational uh, resources on, on security, on privacy, and all that on YouTube. And uh, it's it's a, it's getting a much better community than I expected. It's it's really thriving. It's trying to raise awareness in Iran. Yeah, and this is what I was talking about, you know, this dynamic interplay sort of, uh, you know, on an educational level. Again, thank you so much, guys, for uh, for this talk. I really enjoyed this and uh, I think it's, it's uh, you know, uh, it's totally underrated work that, that you guys are doing and also Zio Zio, you know, with, with your educational channel and, you know, Marty with your newsletter because you, you touch people not only, you know, in the hearts, but on intellectual comprehension level and, and you know, you, you're able to like zoom out and, and, and make them understand the question, why are we here? You know, why Bitcoin? Why are we doing all this? You know, uh, it's not because we're bored or anything, but it, we really want to create, a, a, you know, a better world, right? A better human civilization where, where people are free finally. And because uh, it's, it's, I think, beyond imagination. People can't even imagine, you know, how, let me just say this, how criminal this system is, you know, beginning with central banks, governments, the military industrial corporate complex is everything is so you know so centralized and so above the law that the only power we have is to create as buckminster fuller i think said you know to create a new structure right a new system and don't waste energy fighting the old established system or the old structures i mean i'm just paraphrasing here but thank you again guys and marty zia and if you have any final thoughts or where can people find you on twitter or um, any resources I'm on Twitter at Marty Bent. Um, TFTC.io is where I post a lot of my content. But yeah, no, uh, final thought: just keep fighting a good fight. I think we're, I think we're going to win. I'm confident uh, as long as we have individuals uh, like yourself, uh, Kayvon and, and Zia around the world. Like, I, th I think I'm happy to be on the front line with you two gentlemen. Really enjoyed this. All right, Marty. See ya. Okay, Zia. Let's let's do a wrap up. The two of us. Uh, what you got? What did you think? Yeah, How'd you find great. This? So we. Uh, so the thing is that uh, I had a lot of ideas about like what the government is. Um, what is the plan, and what is what's going to be the situation, and the future uh, in the situation for in the future for the what the government is doing here and. Uh, what I was thinking, what, what what my ideas like somehow are confirmed, but what Marty said, so and what you said actually too, uh, we're 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 gonna do this, and we're, we're, it's gonna uh, the mining is gonna thrive more and it's gonna flourish more, and uh, the the adoption is gonna increase definitely. It's we we are seeing people from all over the world using. It. Bitcoin, and we are seeing all people from all over the world having similar experiences and having similar um, world views about Bitcoin. So I guess that it's inevitable. So it's going to happen. And this was confirmed for me right now. It's because I see people from different places with different uh, like governments and stuff have the same view on what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed this talk because it uh, gives. I mean, this is this is the purpose, you know, of this podcast also to to inspire people, uh, whether they're from Iran or not. It's just uh, uh, like 
this is this is our moment i think this is our moment to to i mean uh, it sounds a little bit kitsch but you know to unite and uh, to 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 comprehend like the bigger vision behind behind bitcoin you know people i think have no clue especially when you don't understand you know the essence of money or the basics of economics or Austrian economics or you know the the power of 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 decentralization of uh, of hard as scarce as money and deflationary economics deflationary technologies <laughs> it's it's i think beyond imagination what kind of prosperity and abundance and peace and and human civilization which again you know i'm repeating myself but this is this is why i'm in bitcoin you know because i see a, a future that we could have had like a long time ago but unfortunately you know whatever uh the powers to be uh you know they they had a, obviously a, a totally different agenda it's all about you know enslavement control surveillance and and systematic theft and yeah criminality. exactly we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna change that for exactly <laughs> okay zero so talk to you soon we'll stay in touch okay thank you again yeah. for your work see you bye 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 zero who Okay, guys, ladies and gentlemen, I really, really enjoyed this talk with Marty Bent from Tales of the Crypt. Definitely, you know, uh, sign up for his newsletter. It's micro dosages of psilocybin and DMT. It's like mind expansion, mind expanding, conscious expanding, and really, you know, expands your comprehension. Whether you're, you know, uh, a, a no coiner, pre coiner, not interested at all, or a total advanced Bitcoiner, every time, you know, it's it 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 transforms our consciousness, our our thinking, our even our emotions, and especially our comprehension level, holistic comprehension level. So thank you again for your support. Make sure you follow Zia and Marty on Twitter. Make sure, please, subscribe to my YouTube channel, subscribe to my podcast platforms, the heartblood of my work. Uh, you can reach me on Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, uh, DM me if you want, or email me at hello at thetotalconnector.com. If you want to support me or us, uh, contribute to the film project, Humanity Rooted in Bitcoin. If you have any skills, talents, or resources, or you want to sponsor us, or you want to sponsor my podcast, please get in touch with me. You can also reach me on Telegram, Kevan Davani. And yeah, the, all the links I'm going to put in the show notes. And again, thank you so much for my heart and for my soul. I'll see you soon again. Bye.